You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Good morning, church. Hey, man. Well, God is good, and all the time, he's really awesome because Denise and Mark are here this morning, amen. I thought I recognized a voice behind me, and I was like, oh, is that Mark? It's like, yes, awesome, it is good to see you all, amen. Well, how about those 49ers? Okay, I'm just, you know, calling them out because there's some, you know, 49er fans here. I'm not really a 49er fan, but um, we know that today is an exciting time because today they play against the L.A. Rams. So I know that you all are looking forward to getting home and watching the game. So I'll only take about five hours with this sermon. I'm I'm just kidding. But before we, you know, really get ready for the game this afternoon, I just want to pause for a moment and can we push rewind and reflect on the games from last weekend I mean that was insane between basketball and football I mean the the um, the games last week were amazing I don't know if you uh, watch any of them but with the basketball games there were some buzzer beating wins with the Warriors I mean they pulled it out at the last second and then the football game between the Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills That was amazing. uh, Social media was lighting up afterwards. Um, There was commentary dissecting every single play. Um, Even when I went to work on Monday, they were recapping the highlights of that game. I don't know if you saw it, but within the last two minutes, the the lead kept shifting back and forth. Um, I believe the Chiefs uh, were able to score with about two minutes left in the game, and then the, the Buffalo Bills turned around, and then they scored, and then the Chiefs turned around and scored. They went into overtime. I mean, I'm not even to football like that. But I was watching it, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, oh, oh it's over. All right, yay, Chiefs. And then I was like, oh, are you kidding? I mean, it was some amazing football. Amen. I mean, there was some serious strategy, strategizing going on. There was timeouts being called and going over and figuring out what is the play that we can execute in order to get this touchdown or in order to gain this yardage here. Uh, There was some serious strategy going on. You know, when you think about it, when there is a championship or an opportunity to get to the Super Bowl, you need to have a strategy. When the, uh, a, a Super Bowl ring or a chance to go to Disneyland or Disney World is on the line, you need to have a strategy. I see Hezekiah back there clapping his hands like, yeah, mom and dad, do you have your strategy for how we're going to get to Disney World? <laughs> To have a strategy means that you're simply developing a plan of action, Mm -hmm. a scheme, a design to achieve an overall goal. Mm -hmm. So every great leader needs a well thought out strategy. Mm -hmm. Even when you think about military, the military, they have various strategies in order to defeat their enemy. Even in corporate America, We have um, short-term strategies and long-term strategies. Things are happening all the time. And so if a company is going to be prosperous in advance, they need a well-thought-out strategy. Now, some of you all have weight loss strategies, and I don't know how you're succeeding in your weight loss strategy, but some of you have developed a weight loss strategy even at the beginning of the year. Some of you might decide to walk more, drink water, um, eat less, whatever it is, you have developed your own strategy for weight loss. Even as Christians, we have a strategy if we, are, we truly call ourselves disciples of Christ and if we truly want to live holy. We know that to be a disciple of Christ, you need to spend time reading your word and having devotion. So maybe your strategy 
for reading your word is that you get up in the morning and you take time first thing before you start to do anything else and you grab your Bible and you sit down, you got your, maybe you have your cup of coffee, who knows, whatever it is, but part of your strategy is to spend your quiet time in the morning before anybody gets up to read your word. Now that's your strategy for studying and having devotion. Some of you all have developed a strategy for memorizing scripture and hiding the word in your heart. Maybe your strategy is that you write scripture down on a note card, and that's how you memorize scripture. Um, some of us were participating and working with Shola uh, last year, and we were memorizing scripture together, and we had different techniques that we used in order to memorize scripture. Some of us got apps. Some of us had uh, study partners, but we had specific strategies to help us memorize scripture. I even had a strategy as the kids were growing up on how we were going to get to church on time. I remember when they were little, uh, in order for me to get to church on time, I, my strategy was that I had to prepare the night before. I would get their clothes laid out, put their shoes by their bed. For Kendall, I would do her hair and tie it up in a little scarf to make sure it didn't get, you know, get all messy by the next morning. And then when they got up, I would cook breakfast in order that we can get out of the door in time in order to get to church. Very strategic plan in order to meet that goal. Amen. Now that they're all grown up, they just roll out of bed and just go. <laughs> but I still try to cook breakfast every now and then on a Sunday morning just to ensure that they're up and so that they can get to church. We all have strategies as it relates to becoming uh, a better steward and a better uh, disciple of Christ. Amen. Now, as I was thinking about my goals for this year, and I was even thinking about this sermon, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Mikhail, what's your strategy for missions? Mm. And I was like, uh, is that like a trick question, Holy Spirit? <laughs> what do you mean, what's my strategy for missions. I'm going to give my offering every fifth Sunday and be obedient like a good Christian? I mean, you know, that's what I was thinking. But in that moment, I went from feeling this tall to this small. Because the Holy Spirit continued his conversation in my mind and in my spirit and said, Mikhail, isn't that what you did last year? Isn't that what you've been doing? Now, how are you going to advance the gospel um, and, and share it with those in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria if you keep on doing the same thing over and over again with no real strategic plan for advancement? Amen. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, Holy Spirit. All right, speak to me. Right. And so even if we have a strategy for missions or we have some type of plan, sometimes our strategy needs an update. The military is constantly updating its strategic plans. Imagine if the military, um, if they went to war and they kept on using the same strategy over and over again, then the enemy would somehow know exactly what was planned and they, the enemy would defeat them. Imagine if a business um, used their same strategy over and over again with no updates and no plans for any change. I tell you, even in corporate America today, because of all the things that are going on with COVID, we are experiencing supply chain issues like we've never had before. So, uh, I know that if you go to Safeway, you're wondering why they don't have everything on the shelf. It is because there is a supply chain strat or issue and businesses have got to change their strategy. Even there is competition in the marketplace, and so businesses ha can't do what they did last year. They've got to change their strategy in order to keep up with competition. Even football coaches don't use the same play over and over again. Now, now again, I don't know a lot about football, but I guarantee you, what the 49ers did last week in order to win, they're most likely going to change things up this week, amen, if they really want to win. 
See, as a team leader, as a coach, you've got to be willing to change up your strategy. And even as ambassadors of Christ, that's who we are called to be. We need to update our strategy. You see, the enemy wants to kill and to steal our, our witness. The enemy would love for us to use the same strategy that we used last year because he knows exactly where our weaknesses are. There is world religions and false prophets out there competing with, the, with false teachings and false claims, and they would love to, to creep on us and be successful in stealing others away from the gospel. But as a body of believers, we've got to be willing to change and update our strategy. Now, here's the thing. It's going to take all of us in order to be successful. The Great Commission says that we are to go. Matthew 28 and and, um, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That passage is not talking to a few. It's talking to all of us. So for today's topic, I want to give you or ask you the question, what's your personal strategy for missions? What's your personal strategy for missions? On um, Friday, during the Zoom prayer, Shola put up a poll. And on that poll, he asked us to assess our prayer life. He asked us to reflect and be able to think about what was the status of our prayer life. Now, there were some who said that their prayer life was at an all-time high. Things are going well. Others indicated that their prayer life, it's okay, but it could be better. Some said that they were struggling, and some said that their prayer life right now was just non-existent. And I'm, I'm wondering if I put up a similar poll today as it relates to missions, What would be your response? How would you assess the status of your strategy for missions? I believe that sometimes we don't even have a strategy because we don't know how to even articulate or define what missions is. Back in 2020, when we were all in a lockdown and we were all on Zoom, we had a missions or sermon that um, a lesson that was dedicated to missions in Africa, and I remember Erin answering the question about um, her understanding of what heart for missions was, and Erin so eloquently shared. She quoted Matthew 29 uh, or 28, 19 through uh, 19 through 20, and she also said this about the heart of missions. We, the followers of Christ, have been commanded to go to the ends of the earth and as we are going to drop seeds of kindness of love, to feed one another, to clothe one another in hopes that it will draw them to accept the gospel message. I was like, wow, Aaron, you hit it out the park with that one. And you might be thinking, of course Aaron would know what missions is. She's on the missions team. She has the gift of evangelism. Of course she knows. But it's not enough for Aaron just to know what missions is and to how to articulate it. The word is calling all of us to have a heart for missions and to understand it. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon where he said that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Now, another word for imposter is pretender. So I'm asking you this morning, are you a pretender? Do you pretend like you understand what missions is? Do you pretend like you have a a strategy for missions? Do you understand what missions really is all about? Now, the simple definition to missions is, the, 
it, it means the fundamental meaning is to send. But we know it's more complex than that. There's a missionary leader, um, Avery Willis, who spent 14 years doing missions work in Indonesia. He provided this definition. The first definition, he expounded on just the word mission. And he said that mission, without, without the S, is total redemption purpose of God to establish his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then he says that missions with the S is the activity of God's people, the church, to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God in the world. It is our responsibility as a church to demonstrate, to proclaim, and go out and share the good news, not just in these four walls, but to the world. Amen. Now, some of us, we might get confused with evangelism and missions. I, I understand that they, they sound similar, right? But there's two distinct differences, or, uh, or, or there, there's a distinct difference between the two. Evangelism, or when you look at the word or the verb evangelize, it's simply to the act of telling others good news. You're just simply sharing the gospel, the good news to, about what Christ did on the cross for us. But I love this explanation that John Piper gives when he says that missions is doing evangelism by crossing culture by learning different languages, learning different cultures where there is no church and where there is no access to the gospel. You see, mission itself can be viewed as a strategy for evangelism. Now, some of us, we might not have a strategy for missions or, or if you're like me, you've been doing the same, using the same strategy over and over again. And I refer to my strategy that I've been using as a call and respond strategy. In other words, when pastor calls, I respond. When pastor says, hey, I need to raise some money for a Better Africa Foundation, I respond. When the church says, hey, give your $10 for mission Sunday, we respond. Amen? Let, let, me, let me give you another example. Hey, Oren, I didn't get a chance to really have uh, breakfast this morning. Um, do you happen to have a snack on you? Oh, you do? Look at there. Praise God. Amen. Woo. Look at that. I called. He responded. Amen. 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 <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Call and respond. Oh, hey, Oren, by the way, I'm going to have lunch with some friends after church today, and I'm a little short on cash. Do, do you have something? Oh, praise God. Look at there. Woo, and glory, hallelujah. It's a $100 bill. God is good. Who wants to be my friend and go to lunch with me? Amen. Call and respond. Now, you might be thinking, what's wrong with that strategy? You're being obedient, right? Nothing wrong with that. But imagine if we flipped the script and we responded before we were called. Imagine if we flipped the script instead of sitting there waiting for somebody to call you, instead of you waiting for pastor to give a call, you just come running. Amen. I didn't call you. Oh, you're responding. You, put, you, you actually, what I'm saying, you're putting into action already? Praise God. Amen. That's, that is a great example of flipping the script and responding before the call. I, see, the thing is, is that if we 
we respond before the call, we will create more of a movement than moments. You see, what just happened, a few moments of, of you know, calling and responding, that, that's great. And we get excited about how we respond to a call and we get, we get so puffed up because we were obedient. But I tell you today, I believe that God is doing something, calling us to do something much greater than just having these little mini moments. Because see, when you can just reflect on like, okay, you know what? Yeah, you're right. There was once that I gave to the, the whale project. Yeah, and there was a time that I... Um, I contributed to BAF, and I think I did donate for the walkathon one time. If you can recall just these little mini moments, that, that's good. Don't get me wrong. We praise God that you're participating, but I believe that God is trying to call us from having these mission moments to a missions movement. I believe that God wants to do something mighty and powerful in this church but we've got to be willing to go from these little mini uh, mission moments to more of a missions movement. Amen. And so you're wondering, Mikhail, how do we move from mission moments to mission movement? Well, I I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's look at the very beginning of Paul's missionary journey. In Acts, open up your Bibles or open up your, your phone, whatever you've got in front of you. And let's read Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. Acts 13, 1 through 3. It reads, In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with, the Herod, with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is the very beginning of Paul's missionary journey. This is almost like the prelude. And so even before this moment, what you have to understand is that um, Paul had some missionary moments Right after he was converted and after he met Jesus on the side road of Damascus, he, moved, he went into Damascus and he began to share his testimony. He began to preach to them and he moved around just in small locations to share with them. He was preaching so much that he began to baffle the Jews on what his message was about who Jesus was. And so Paul just kind of stayed local and, you know, it would have been fine, perhaps, if Paul had just stayed in the Damascus area, but God had a movement in store for Paul. Amen. And so he sets the tone and has him have this experience to prepare him for what will become one of the greatest missionary moments of all times. Amen. Now, there are three distinct components that I want to highlight today that will help us give birth to our mission mo movement. Mm -hmm. right. The first one is diversity. Mm -hmm. Now, in this passage, we see five names listed. Now, the writer Luke, he could have just said the church people, the, or could have just said that the prophets and the teachers were here, and, then, um, he, and they worshiped and fasted. But instead, instead, he specifically identified five people in this passage. First, we see that there is Barnabas listed. And Barnabas is listed first, and some theologians believe that when the name is listed first, it means that he has seniority. He's perhaps the lead pastor or the one who has the most experience. And then we see Simon or Simeon listed and he, we're given a description that he's called Niger. In other words, Niger is, means black. 
And so we see that there is a, a racial diversity in this group. And then even Manaus, we are told that he is, um, he hung out with Herod. He was raised with Herod. Some say that he was like the foster brother of Herod. So he's going to bring this understanding of how to minister to the royal family. And then we have Saul, whose name is Saul, reference Saul here, not Paul just yet, because perhaps there is still some maturity and development that must take place. So you see that in order for us to have a, to give birth to a movement, we need diversity. Amen. We need each and every one of us in this place to be a part of that movement. We need every spiritual gift. We need every, um, whether you're on a, in a high income bracket or a low income bracket, you are needed. Amen. Imagine if Hope uh, continued to learn French and the next time she went to Africa, she would be able to uh, give the gospel in French. Amen? Amen. Amen? There is a need for a diversity of skills, a diversity of gifts, a diversity of race. I mean, some of us, I, I would I love one day if we have an opportunity to have those who speak Spanish come to our church. Amen. And we can be able to use our language skills even to share and to witness with them. The second component that is needed is to worship and fast. Amen. In the passage, they, they were in the church and they were both worshiping and fasting. See, I, I love the fact that there is this combination of worshiping and fasting. There is a benefit to combining the two. Amen. Now, in the 1930s, fast food restaurants started selling combos. They would sell not just the, the hamburger, but they would create a combo so that you could buy your hamburger, your french fries, and your drink. Now, there was great uh, purpose for having this combo. One is that it provided an economic value, and then two, that it was sort of satisfying. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't go to uh, Wendy's or Habits or some of these fast food places and just order a burger. I, I need the french fries and the Coke to wash it down. I mean, there's something about having this, this burger and then you've got the saltiness of the french fry. Oh, and don't let me upsize my combo and add a milkshake or a frosty with that. So you, then you've got the sweetness with the, with the saltiness. There is something special about this combo. I don't know, I'm starting to fantasize about burgers. Maybe it's because I've been on the Daniel fast and I haven't had meat in a while. I don't know. But there's something special about that combo. Now, you can order a burger a la carte, and that might be okay. You can worship God a la carte, and that might be okay. But I tell you, when you combine worship with fasting it, there's something different there's something sweet about it when you are fasting hallelujah that when you deprive yourself and deny yourself of the things that you want in a fast it makes opens up room for the holy spirit to speak to you i tell you i want to encourage us if we're going to really move or change things and and take make a a missions movement then we need to order a combo this year hallelujah i tell you that the chinese um, horoscope says that this is the year of the water tiger but i'm here to tell you this is the year of the combo we need to be a body of believers who are committed to not only worshiping god not only praying and singing but we got to spend quality time fasting Amen. hallelujah Amen. Yes. 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 Yes, Lord. the third component yes. to help us give birth to this missions movement is to wait on the Holy Spirit. Amen. To wait on the Holy Spirit. Some of you might even be thinking right now, okay, I've got some ideas for missions and I could be doing this, I could be doing that. Have you consulted with the Holy Spirit yet? Slow down. We've got to wait on the Holy Spirit. If you respond, 
um, before it's before you are called, you might be doing something that the Holy Spirit hasn't even called you to do. And then you wonder why it doesn't succeed. It's because you have not consulted the Holy Spirit. Imagine if the other three men who were not sent out with Barnabas and Saul, if they uh, did not allow to listen to the Holy Spirit, they might have been salty themselves thinking about, well, why can't I go on this mission? Why isn't God calling me? But we've got to be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the guiding. Even as Paul continued on his missionary journey, I love the fact that the Holy Spirit was guiding him every step of the way. In Acts 16, it tells us that Paul was preaching, um, and his plan was to preach in the providence of Asia, but it was the Holy Spirit who told him, don't go that way. I need you to go another way. There is a group of people in Macedonia that need you right now. And so I'm here to tell you that when you wait on the Holy Spirit, you might have a direction to go this way, but God might say there's a group of folks over here in this land. There's a group of folks over here in this country. There's a group of folks over here in this nation that need your missionary work. Amen. Now, I have no idea what God is calling you to do as it relates to your strategy for missions. Some of you, um, you might, God might be calling you to contribute to books and make sure that they're equipped in other languages or Bibles in other languages. Others of you... Uh, May, God might be stirring up something special in your heart, but I have no idea. But I do want to give you some suggestions on how to fine tune your personal strategy as you begin to think about missions work. Amen. So the first recommendation is that you be willing to pray and send or even go. You need to be willing to pray, to send, or even go. We can all pray. And when I say send, I mean there might be a special financial support that God is calling you to do, and you've got to be willing to do that. Amen. And there might even be some of you who God is actually calling you to go. When I think about um, Mark's mom going to Africa, I mean, who would have thought a woman at her age God would have called her to physically go to Africa, but yet she was willing to go. The second suggestion that I want to encourage you with is stop treating missions as your to-do list. Stop treating missions as if it were your to-do list. You see, I, I love a good to-do list. I, I like being able to uh, write things down, put the little box there and check it off. Uh, sometimes I'll even make my list the night before or, um, you know, send messages to my email box so that I'm organized for the next day. I, I love a good to-do list because the to-do list helps you remember not to, um, not to forget things, right? It, it, it teaches you or prepares you to make sure that you don't forget something. But there's some, there's some things that we just don't put on the to-do list, like brushing your teeth or getting dressed in the morning. You don't have those on your to-do list. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> that just becomes a part of your everyday living, right? Those are just things you automatically do. Missions should just become a part of your everyday living. Amen. It should just be something that you automatically do. The fact that the Holy Spirit had to check me and say, Mikhail, what's your new strategy for missions? I was like, what? He's like, you've been treating it as a to-do list. You've been checking the box, you know, looking forward to the fifth Sunday so you can check that box and move on. But we need to do, be about missions as we are going. Amen. There might be your neighbor, you may never have the opportunity to evangelize to them, but you can have use them as your mission field just by saying, you know what, I'm on my way to the grocery store. Let me check in with that neighbor and ask and see if they need any groceries or if they need me to pick up something from the store. 
Maybe as you are going and you're at lunch at work and your coworker who may not be open to hearing the actual evangelism message or the, the good news about Jesus, maybe you can start missioning to them and just offer them a lunch. There are different ways that we can make it a part of our everyday living. Amen. The third is that we need to be proactive instead of reactive. We need to be proactive instead of reactive. You know, um, when Oren brought me this bag here, he actually was proactive and thinking about what my needs would be. So he proactively thought about, you know what, Mikhail, you're up there preaching. Let me give you some water. And then he thought, you know what, I know sometimes you get, you know, your throat gets dry. Perhaps I'll give you some, some throat coat um, to, to quench your, your throat. And then in his bag here, he gave me a handkerchief. Perhaps he's like, you know what, Mikhail, let, let the Lord use you. And if you start perspiring, you just, you know, you need a, a handkerchief and you can just wipe your brow. Amen. <laughs> but that is being an example of being proactive. You know, we know that there are five Sundays in this year and we already know what the, um, what the call or what the ask is. But why don't we be proactive and prepare a special offering for that fifth Sunday? Amen. We need to have the spirit even of being proactive where we're like, hey, put me in, coach. Right? right? You're not just waiting for pastor to call you. You're coming up to pastor and you're like, pastor, I've been praying and I've been fasting and the Holy Spirit has given me an idea. I just want to share it with you. I want to be proactive just in case. This might be an opportunity, but you're being proactive and not reactive. Amen. Amen. And then the last strategy I want to give to you is to avoid the shiny penny syndrome. To avoid the shiny penny syndrome. What I mean is, is that oftentimes when we get these ideas or something comes our way, we start uh, researching. Even for me, when I was thinking about, all right, Holy Spirit, you want me to... Uh, update my strategy for missions work this year? Well, let me just go online and start looking for um, some new programs, some new things that I can get involved in. And I started getting excited as I started thinking about things. But then the Holy Spirit said, Mikhail, you know what? Beware of those shiny pennies. There is an old penny that is in the church and it's missions work and it's called BAF. And you can use that even as your strategic plan for missions work. See, sometimes we think that just because we've been doing something and participating that we need something new. But God may call, be calling you to continue to support that ministry and support BAF, but just do something new about it. You might be, give, be giving in one area, but God is calling you to do something uh, or do, take that giving to another level. Amen. Beware of those shiny pennies and, and the energy that it takes and be able to reserve that energy to help and support the missions, uh, the things that Village has right now. Amen. Now, the ultimate goal for us is to win people to Christ according to our mission statement. Amen. But we've got to ask ourselves, what will be our personal strat strategy for 2022? Yeah. You see, we don't want to just take this gospel message and um, throw a few yards and, and have it go a few feet down the mission field. But we're looking for touchdown after touchdown after touchdown when it comes to missions work. Yes. And I want to encourage us today, don't just put all the weight on one person like the football teams did last week when they either put the weight on the, the kicker or the quarterback to win the game. This is going to be a team effort. We all have to contribute to working towards advancing the gospel and moving the, uh, the missions work here at Village. Yes. I shared with you the definition from Avery Willis earlier, the missionary. He actually passed away in 2010. But listen to the words that were spoken about his life. It says that Avery, his walk with the Lord, was authentic. His faith was contagious. His vision unlimited. 
to participate in a planning or strategic session with Avery was to be challenged beyond the ordinary and to catch a vision of possibility characterized by the power and providence of God. Imagine if someone wrote such kind words about you, that you were committed to the work of missions, and that you, would, you, you were creative and, and you were committed, and there was an a, a intensity about your work, and that you believed in the power and the providence of God. So this morning, again, I ask you, what is your personal strategy for missions? It is going to take all of us in order to move or to change these mission moments into a movement. Amen? Amen? Amen. As, the, as we prepare to sing, I would just want to be able to go to God in prayer for a moment and... I want you to take a moment to think about what it is that God is calling you to do. How will you prepare and to think through and develop your new strategy for missions in 2022? Let us pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.